Here we are. As always, lifting up those flags from distinct nationalities. Greeting all those that are watching us. And the director is doing a general pan of all the people present. First Sunday of the year. First Sunday. First event. Don't stop that applause, people. Something is happening here at River. How beautiful. Look, look, look. That applause is for the Lord, for the Holy Spirit, for the King. The King is in the house. Good morning. Look, I see the Argentinian flag and it excites me. May God bless you. May he protect you. We had an introduction here recently with the people present. This is the first service of the year. I hope that everything that you ate, you were able to digest. I know some of you looked in the mirror and said, oh, I ate too much, but this year I'm going to start my diet. Well, not today, not on, not on the first, because you retired from the 31st. And from the second, no, you still had leftovers. So next Monday, and that's tomorrow. And so tomorrow, the majority of people will, be, will begin their diets. And I hope the Lord gives you discipline. Here's some advice from someone that struggles with it as well. Even if it's 10 minutes, 5 minutes of walking, of going on the treadmill, don't say, I'm going to start with an hour and a half and I'm going to get rid of all this fat. It won't happen. You have to start with 3, 4, 5 minutes and also have spiritual discipline this year to say, Lord, I'm going to read your word more, at least one or two verses a day. Look what I'm saying. Sometimes we don't even take the Bible because it's easier to grab the TV control for Netflix. Or you say, ah, let me turn on the TV. Or when you connect to streaming or when you start watching videos on your phone with that content that never ends on your phone, you say, how am I going to read the Bible? But if you say, Lord, before anything, while I'm making myself coffee or while you're having breakfast, say, I'm going to receive a word from the Lord. And some say, yeah, but I don't really understand anything I read. Well, let me suggest, start with Proverbs or with the book of Psalms. Proverbs are principles, axioms of wisdom, and the Psalms, the majority of them are, are songs, poems, prose. So you can say, well, let me read this proverb. If you can memorize it, you have no idea how your deposit will be filled with marvelous things. Because when you're in a crisis, you can take from your deposit. The Holy Spirit can't take something from a deposit that doesn't have it. Everything that's good and pure and loving, anything that comes from God, you must think about that. So when you fill your deposit with those things and then you go into a crisis, you say, Lord, what, what word do I have? What word do I have? And then suddenly you think about squid games. <laughs> because that's the only thing in your deposit because that's what your head is filled with. You filled it with, with, with trash. <laughs> So when you want to take a word, the Holy Spirit says, well, I want to find from in your deposit, but I didn't find anything. I found the house of cards. I kept looking. And then I found just anything else, you know? So when you say, Lord, I want to fill my deposit with good things. And then when, when we're in a crisis, that's where that word appears. That's where that verse appears. So this new year, this year of change and transition of new beginnings, it's a year of new beginnings, of new decisions. How can I say? Uh, new resolutions for this new year. Are we happy? Yes or no, people? And at home as well. Thank you for supporting us all these years. Thank you for being there, for connecting. I know some are awaiting today's word. I'm about to transmit it, but before, let me tell you what's happening in Cuba. It's just a little bit of news. It's a short video, a small report of how we're doing in Cuba. What God begins... Man cannot finish. What God starts, no man can say stop. I remember being on the same stage when the governor of California, who we sent a, a special greeting to, Governor Newsom, he said, you can't have your services. We couldn't even transmit live from here. Then later he said, all right, it's fine, but with restrictions, there has to be distancing. It seemed like it happened long ago, but it happened. And he said, children, no children. No elderly, those that, that are in a dangerous age couldn't come. So I couldn't come because I'm, I'm up there. But we began to understand. Of course, you have to, under, you have to respect authority. But there's always a greater authority that goes beyond any president or minister or governor here on earth. And so we know that Cuba is living under a singular government. And it's been that way for many decades. But we know that God sent us there to help. 
We're not going against the regime. We're not going against the politics. We're not going there to generate anything. We're not gathering up votes. This doesn't have to do with, with, with an election or anything political. It has to do far from any, any militancy. It's about helping people. And we went to go help, and we want to finish this marvelous work. I want to show you our village, our neighborhood in Cuba, where we're going to give six new homes to elderly couples. We'll tell you their stories, and we're going to honor them and bless them. This is what's happening in Cuba. On that beloved island, we send a greeting to all the Cubans. River News, here we go. Hola, River. Aquí, actualizándote un poco acerca de la construcción de Cuba. Ya vamos por la cuarta y quinta construcción. Tenemos ya casi tres casas concluidas, cisternas de aguas, tenemos fosa séptica y se va construyendo todo esto. Estamos casi ya terminando la primera etapa de la construcción, que son las cuatro casas. Algunos detalles que nos impiden seguir avanzando con rapidez. La lluvia llega, de pronto se va, pero déjenme mostrarles cómo vamos. Tenemos piso de tile, ya casi con iluminación. Tenemos las ventanas, todo funcionando. El baño ya prácticamente está terminado. Gracias a ti, gracias a tus oraciones, Cuba sigue adelante porque somos River. Thank you, my beloved Rudy. Thank you. Thank you for the information and the update. It's just to share with you. I don't want you to think that we forgot about it. We're still going on with that work. It's not easy to find materials. And you might ask, well, construction takes so long? Yeah, in Cuba it does. Here, in a week, you can build a skyscraper, but over there you have to find materials. It's not wood. It's all cement and brick and, and tile. Sometimes you have to bring it from different regions those elements are scarce so it's it's hard but it's it's our goal it's just a seed when we see those elderly couples faces and smiles when they receive their homes with dignity i think we'll feel that we put a little bit of mercy and grace in cuba agreeing to all the cubans we're praying for you we're praying for you continue being joyous we love you so much god bless all of you very well are we ready stay with me i'm ready this is the first message of the year, and it has to do with the spiritual foundations for this 2024, and I need, I mean, I know, I, I take it for granted, but I need you to pay attention, as you've never paid attention to any other preacher on the face of this earth and in the cosmos and in the universe, with all your five senses, because it has to do with the foundations of this transition. Many years back, when my hair was very black, and when I was very young, I received a prophetic word that the Lord would give me the providence of traveling from nation to nation and he would lend me the ears of many people. And from then on, I was very young and unexperienced, immature. I was a fool. I thought that I had to do something in respect to that immediately, that everything would be easier if I could accomplish first being a young businessman because I said... If I'm a young businessman, then I'll have my own resources. I'll be able to fulfill this mission that God is sending me on. But I need resources for that. I can't depend on anyone. It's noble and praiseable what I was thinking. I first thought about becoming a businessman and then a provider to my own ministry. I admired those that said, I have my own business. And I don't need anyone's support. I don't need to live off of any offering or what the people give to me. I can fund my own ministry. And so though I was very young and, and was hardworking, I was very hardworking in the business that hired me until I became one of the best salesmen. And sometime later, I was 22 years old. I had just turned 22. I was able to rise to become a manager in that business in a shopping mall in Buenos Aires. And so I was very young and I had many employees under my management and I earned much more than any other person that had spent years at that business. So I had, I had done it. Back then I had a great salary and I foolishly thought that I could sing. There's a season in life where you believe you can do everything, right? I thought I could sing. I thought that I could stay in tune more or less so that I decided to record a few CDs. Well, back in those days... 
they were cassettes. I, like I always say, if you know what a cassette is, then it's time for you to get your annual colonoscopy. It's time, okay? You're at that age. And if you say, yeah, 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 I even had cassettes, well, you better go check your prostate urgently because at this age, you have to present, uh, prevent. The point is that those cassettes, I had 14 songs on each cassette. Don't try and search for them online because I made it my own job to make any of that evidence disappear. You won't find it. Since I had money, I would pay for publicity on magazines and newspapers. There was no social media. And so I launched myself into stardom. I was sure that God had sent me to serve him in that way. My intentions were noble, but my vision was very selfish. I wasn't acting humbly. I wanted to be well-known. I wanted to be grandiose. I imagined everything that I could do for God, and I would say, God, you're so lucky to have me <laughs> amongst your followers. How beautiful. I thought God looked down on me and said, man, good thing Dante was born. And yet, at the age of 22, with a promise from God in my hand, I thought that it was just a matter of doing it on my own, of of launching my dreams, my ideas. At first, I thought that I would be a great businessman and that I would solve it my own costs while I go through through the world doing great things for God. It sounds noble. It sounds like a vision from God. It doesn't sound bad, but once I had the resources and once I had a few ideas or a few phrases that were revolutionary and I had a great desire to serve God, I realized that all that wasn't enough. And I didn't take into account that with that promise, there's always a process. With the promise, there's always a process. And that's what I call the transition. Always. So after a few months of becoming manager, one day to make a long story short, they fired me abruptly without paying me a single dollar, accusing me unjustly of having stolen from the business. On that morning, I went into my office with my chest puffed out. And that night, I went home, hunched over, with a withered forehead. However, something historic was happening inside of me at that moment. I didn't realize that the true transformation had just begun. From that moment I was fired, God began to work in many aspects with my character. And he also began to eliminate or began to eliminate what didn't please him with my conduct. And the Lord still isn't done. I'm not here because I'm a finished model. But that's when the Lord said, I have to eliminate um, a lot of things from your conduct, from your character. And that day when I hit rock bottom for the first time, there God's calling in my life began to become a reality. It's as if God said, all right, Dante, now that I have your attention, I'm going to teach you a few important things that up until now you weren't willing to listen to. Now that I have your attention, let's begin. And that's where he began. Now that I think about it, if God had sent me to serve him without that bitter process, it was bitter in its moment, then I, I would have been a disaster. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. No one. Back then, I had the correct foundation because like many of you, I was born in a Christian household. Well, I wasn't born into it, but at the age of seven, my entire family gave their lives to Christ, and so I was brought up with a Christian foundation. I can't say that at home they didn't teach us biblical foundation, but I wasn't building upon it in the right way. I was trying to build... Well, the foundation was correct, but I was trying to build with wood, hay, and scrap. Anything to just quickly get to the goal. I never waited for the Lord to guide me. It never, it never occurred to me to say, All right, Lord, you gave me your call. So now what should I wait for? Or what should I do? No, on the contrary. I wanted to lift up a ministry, a life, a, a family, basing myself on my dreams, my ambitions. So in essence, I was or I tried to go before they even sent me so God had to humble me because I wasn't wise enough to humble myself so you either humble yourself or 
you're humbled. You either give yourself to the Lord saying, here I am, or the Lord will say, I'll make you say, I'm here, Lord. <laughs> and let me confess something to you that each day I'm more and more convinced of. And now I'm fully convinced that if I had accomplished what I was seeking when I was young, then I'm sure that in the best of cases, today, I would be just plain that I serve God, consumed by ego, I would, be, I would be consumed by pride. In fact, I would be bitter against the whole world because pride is that. It's the root of all evil. When you're filled with ego, you begin to be jealous because why does that person have that? Why do they receive more? And you become bitter. That's corrosive. So in that moment, what appeared to me as God disappointing me no he was saving my life he said if i let this guy go like this he's going to be a lost cause now fine i'm aware that god tends to call us to do important things throughout many moments in our lives but on certain occasions those callings don't turn out the way we thought they would play out I said, I wanted to serve you. I wanted to be a part of the choir or I wanted to be an usher or preach or sing or play, play an instrument. But how many times have we felt guided by God to do something that we believed was noble just the way I did, something praiseable? I wanted to preach. I didn't want to become a millionaire. But then it became an embarrassing situation, a complicated situation. How many times have we been through something where you felt like starting a business all by yourself and you said, I'm tired of being an employee. I don't want to depend on that manager or I don't want to be dependent on anyone. I want to have my own company. I want to be a head and not a tail. I want to be above and not below. And so you take hold of that promise and you dedicate yourself to that with great illusion. But when you get to the end of the month, you have no way to pay your payroll. And you say, I don't know, I believe God and now I have more debts than ever. There are many people that believed, that they believed in the Lord. You believed God. But it just didn't work out. Well, not, not yet, right? Or you had a dream. You said, I'm, I'm done with this addiction. No more alcohol or in the worst of cases, drugs or pornography. And you said, I'm going to finish off that that history, that dysfunctional history, and you thought that you would then become a good husband, a good wife, with your dream marriage, your dream children, and now you look back, you look back at your life and you do checks and balances and you realize that your marriage isn't a model marriage, your kids aren't the ones that you dreamed of, and you say, I believed in God, I had every desire to believe in Him, just like me at the age of 22, when I thought it was my time to start my ministry, People are saying, I feel like doing something different for God. And some have even taken a great leap of faith. There are people watching me now that have taken a great leap of faith and they took that risk. In all of our countries, there are people saying, it's my time. And they leave and they go. Maybe that calling was genuine. But judging off of how things are, are going now, you ask yourself, was this really from God? Or did I just make this up in my imagination? How many times have we said, did God really speak to me? Or was it just my indigestion from eating so many tacos and burritos Christmas night or, or New Year's? Was it indigestion that brought me here? Really? I'm sure many men and women of God have asked themselves that at all levels of spirituality. At a certain point, we ask, did I just get into it because I'm audacious? And this is the heart or the core of the problem. The majority of times, we have the tendency of getting off the boat and walking on the water much before God has called us to abandon the boat. And that's a great issue. I'm a great defender of the active gospel of doing. I always say it's preferable to make a mistake by doing than by being passive. However, it's still a great mistake to have the characteristic of always getting off the boat before making sure that God is calling you. And of course God wants us to get off the boat at one point or another. At one point we have to abandon our comfort zone and assume risks and everything. In life you assume risks. You begin a career, you're assuming the risk of 
who knows if this is what I'm going to like doing when I'm an adult, but it's what attracts me. It's a risk. You get married, and it's a risk because you don't know that person completely. You have children, and it's a risk because you don't know how you're going to be as a parent. And when you learn to be a parent, you're then, you then become a grandparent. But when you begin and run risks, it's elusive to think that the Lord won't sign us up for the university of character. Anytime you want to assume a risk, before that, there's always a transition, the process, the university of character. If not, God won't uh, permit us to crash our faces against the wall. Or if he does allow it, like in my case, it's for us to learn to not just calculate the risks, but be sure if it's the time. The calling is genuine, but the point is, is it the right time? And no man shows this principle better than Moses. I'm going to make the long story short, but it just so happens that in Egypt, a pharaoh goes into power that begins to oppress the Hebrews. And he gives an order, amongst other orders, to kill all the infant boys that are Jewish because his slave population was too great and he was afraid that one day they would become too numerous that they could take control of Egypt. And in that, in those turbulent times of of, 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 of genocide, of, of assassination, Moses' family hides him for three months. What any parent would do, once they saw that it was impossible to hide him because the baby was crying, or maybe a neighbor could, could tell on them or the soldiers might hear him, his mother covers a basket with pitch and resin, places Moses in the basket, and Exodus 2.3 says, then she put it among the, the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, and she found Moses there crying. So she took Moses as her own and, and raised him. Obviously, it's, it's a turn of events that nobody expected. The Hebrew baby that should have died soon after birth had now become part of the Egyptian royalty, growing up in the corridors of power with, the, with an elite education from the pharaohs. He became a part of royalty. He became the prince of Egypt. But he knew he was adopted. He knew that he hadn't been born in the palace. And the book of Acts... 7.23 tells us that when Moses turned 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He said, let me go and see my real brothers. He knew he was Hebrew, and he saw that his own people were under the burden of slavery, of forced work. And scripture tells us that as he saw one of his Hebrew brothers that was being mistreated, he defends him. And he actually kills the Egyptian. He avenged the oppressed because he thought that his Hebrew brothers would understand that the Lord would set them free by his hand. Moses thought, if, I have, if I'm at the palace, it's because I have a calling. I have a purpose. And so if I have that calling, let me just start the, the liberation now. I'm going to kill the first Egyptian that I see mistreating my own brother. Then the next day, he sees two Israelites that are arguing. And he says, hey, you guys are brothers. Why are you hurting each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Huh? Because that's where all the Argentinian descendants came from. He, he said, starkly, he said, hey, who put you in power, brother? And he said, are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? So the rumor had spread that, that Moses was an, was an assassin. So Moses was convinced that he was the right man and that he was doing the right thing for God. He had the vision of being the liberator of his people. From that moment, his dream was noble. It had, it had good intent. But when he decides to fulfill his dream, he ends up killing a man and he fails. The vision was noble, yes. Moses still wasn't ready to take on that noble vision. Was the foundation correct? Yes. But what he used to, to build was not correct. The foundation was right. The vision was right. But it wasn't the right time. His character 
still could not sustain his calling. And God knows if we can sustain or hold up our calling. Many of us ask God for blessings in different times of our lives, and God says, you're still not ready to manage my blessings. Not everyone can receive a net full of fish from night to day. There are people that just aren't ready. We've seen it in public cases. I'm not stereotyping anyone, but I'm, I'm talking about... We've seen it in, in soccer players and boxers who one day win a trophy or sign a contract. We've seen it in people that win the lottery. They pass from having nothing to having millions. And how long does it last? Do they know how to invest? Do they know how to make their money work? Do they know how to save it? No, they spend it. They, they, they spend on, on, on all luxuries and coats and a Lamborghini and a Ferrari because they want all the luxuries they never had. And anyone that had money their whole lives say, no, that's not going to work. You're going to dilapidate it all. Go one dollar at a time. And the same thing happens in spiritual terms. Not all of us have the character to sustain what we asked for. If the Lord said yes to everything, to every one of us, the world would be chaos. Now, in simple terms, when I say we don't have the character to sometimes sustain the blessing or the calling, well, what is that character? Well, it's... It's a conglomeration of, of, of characteristics, the heart of who we are. The world doesn't pay attention to our character. It pays attention to our credentials. When you look for a job, you don't say, look, I have good character. I always come early. I'm hardworking. No, you have to present a, a resume or a CV that can attest to our credentials in, in, in our profession or our skills. After that, we show references. They can call your old employer, your old manager, and see if they give good or bad reference. Or we tend to judge someone's success based on the material possessions that they own. I had a friend many years ago. I said I had because he's no longer my friend. That would catalog someone's worth based on the, the car that they were driving. That was his custom. He would say, oh, you have no idea the car that this guy is driving. Oh, you have no clue. He would always say, oh, this guy finally made it. Oh, he knew how to make it. He came here with nothing, and now he drives a Hummer. And he would uh, drool when he would say Hummer. He would say, oh, he drives a Hummer, and a Hummer is the scariest thing you can drive. It's difficult to park, oh, but you feel like a transformer up there, and you look down on all the ants next to you with their little cars. And he would say, he drives a Hummer. You have no idea the home that he built for himself. And I remember that I also met that guy who drove the Hummer. And he was the most immature, fleshly, angry man I've ever met. He was a terrible guy. I couldn't spend five minutes with him without arguing over something. Even if you're someone that doesn't argue, he would still find a way to argue with you. Because he had an irate way of treating people. But he drove a Hummer. He was my friend's model to follow. Glory to God that that guy is not my friend anymore. Not him, nor the guy with the Hummer. <laughs> and the same thing happens when we judge a pastor. How do we judge a pastor? Well, by the size of his, of his congregation, not by his character. If he has a big church, it's because he's anointed, period. Oh, no, you have no idea the church he has. There are thousands and thousands of people. And maybe a church that's called to lead a smaller church in a village or a town... Or maybe in a city, but he pastors a smaller church. People say, oh, no, something's not going well because look how that guy grew and he's not. Because we judge based off what we see. But God says, I go directly to the heart and that's the heart of character. First book of Samuel 16, 7 says, do not consider his appearance or his height. Don't look if he drives a Hummer or a Tesla because I discard him for me. That doesn't matter where he lives, the credit he has. Jehovah doesn't see what man sees. Man sees what's in front of his eyes. But Jehovah sees the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. That's his measuring tape. Isn't it marvelous? Good thing, right? So when God looks for a leader, he chooses a person not based off of their capacity, or their credit score, or the numbers on their bank account, much less their car or their, or their clothes. Second Chronicles 
16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He gives favor and strength to those who have a heart fully committed to them. He says, I'm not looking for perfect people. I'm looking for people with a perfect heart. Those that have a character that I was able to mold. And not just God. Not only God seeks good character. We all seek these qualities in any person that guides us. Children look for character in their mother and their father. It's not the same thing as temperament because there's a sister that says, oh, I have good character. No, you just have bad temperament. That's not good character. Character is what holds you up. What keeps you firm in your convictions. And as I always say, in the art of, leadering, of leading people, we tend to hire someone always based off their capacity. And notice, every time we fire them, it's because of their character. It's never the opposite. Well, I've never hired somebody because of their character, and then I fire them due to lack of capacity. No, you hire them because they know how to manage a computer. They know how to run the programs. They know how to use Excel. They're a good engineer. They're good at lighting. They're a good musician. But you end up firing them because you, can, you can't stand them. They don't follow instructions. They don't obey. They don't respect authority. You hire them due to their capacity, and you fire them due to their character. And the Lord avoids these things. He says, without any character, I won't send you. I'm not going to hire you based on your capacity. You may know how to preach. You may know how to sing. But I'm not going to hire you based on your capacity to then regret having to fire you over your character. First, you're going to be put to the test. All around the world, people cry out for people with character. Look at the political panorama around the world. It's contaminated with leaders that accumulate power and riches for themselves. Every day, character is sacrificed at the altar of selfishness and personal convenience. And as soon as a politician mentions, oh, may God bless you at the end of his, his speech, or may the powers of heaven, then a bunch of believers that are confused say, oh, we're before a man of God, he mentioned heaven. The masses moan and cry out for a man with character to rise up and lead them. But character isn't just what you say with your mouth. No, you see it in, in, in the acts of what we do. There are many people that have the ability to ascend to the summit, but character is what keeps them there. Your character determines how far you'll go, how long we'll go, and how many will go with us. That's character. And unfortunately, reading books, having ideas, having a great desire to do things, that doesn't develop our heart or our character. If only there were a book, 12 Steps to Have Good Character. Not even this message can gift you good character. Don't expect me to say, I'm going to send you the power of good character in this hand. I feel it's leaving my hand. That's not going to work that way. The most I can do and foolishly is incite you to making decisions that will help you build that character. But I can't just magically give you the power of character. For that reason, there are no conferences to develop character. You'll never see a conference for character. No, there's a conference for growth and empowerment, anointing, liberation, freedom. Tongues, there is no conference for character because the only one that can teach us about character is the Lord. You can't learn it through a coach. And nothing reveals what we're made of like times of trial, times of crisis. When you're under pressure, that's where you find out who you are. Always. We're citrus fruits like oranges or the lemons. We give our juice when we're squeezed. Someone says, oh, I, can't. I left church on Sunday so blessed. They get on the freeway or they're driving home. And an Asian cuts them off. And there that lime juice is squeezed out. <laughs> when tough times put us to the test, there our true nature is exposed. I don't know if it's ever happened to you. Literally being in traffic or, or stuck somewhere. Or I wouldn't say an insult es escapes you or maybe a, a rude word. You say, I'm in a rush. How can it be? And you look back and your kid is watching you and he says, wow. 
Because they observe us, how we react, what juice is squeezed out of us. And Paul writes to the believers in the book of Romans and says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know, we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance character and character produces hope. And that's in Romans 5.3. Look at everything we have to do to reach hope. Tribulation, trials, then hope comes. But you have to go through that process of pressure. So we can put our hands on someone and pray for them. May the Lord bless this business. Lord, I pray for this ministry. And it's fine because you're asking for a blessing for this new thing. But you can't give them an anointing of character. I can pray so that a business starts off well. We're going to pray that the Lord give you the way to start right. But for it to be held up and sustained, I can't pray for that. I can't pray for you to hold yourself up this whole year. That's acquired through a process with the Lord. In these last weeks or in these last months, many people wrote to me from, from my country asking if I would pray for the new Argentinian president the same way I did with Nayib Bukele in El Salvador. I've known Nayib Bukele from when he was a candidate. We developed a friendship and I committed to go and pray for him if he became president. But now they believe that I dedicate my life to going through the world praying for presidents on my free time, right? And I understand the motivations from the requests. A sister said, you have to come and pray for our president. But I'm also aware that we can't vote for whoever we want. And I'm not judging anyone or anyone's values or decisions and expect to just fix everything by laying the laying of hands. I remember at the church where I was brought up, a mom would bring her rebellious child and she would tell the pastor, pray for this rebellious kid. He doesn't want to do his homework. And the kid would say, ah, da, da. no, he's just uneducated. He doesn't have a demon. He is the demon. <laughs> so they write to me, I want you to come and bless the president so the country does well. No, magic doesn't exist. Shortcuts to build good character, that doesn't exist. What do I know if he's going to be a good president? But he definitely won't be a good one just because I pray for him. But that's believing that there's osmosis or magic that I can vote for whoever I want, but as long as someone prays for him, that he'll become Winston Churchill. No, it doesn't work that way. That's why Paul warned in 1 Timothy 5.22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Let's not rush to say, receive this donation so you can be a businessman. What do I know if the guy's going to have the discipline to wake up early every morning because there's no greater discipline expected than the person that works for themselves. There are people that want to work for themselves to not have a schedule, but it's completely the opposite. Sometimes I dream of being an employee so I can have a schedule and get home at 5 p.m. so no one bothers me. I clock out and I don't work anymore. And at 501, get in my car and leave. I wouldn't love anything more than that at certain times. I would love to just fulfill my schedule, say this is my job description, and that's it. But when you're in charge of something, there's no schedule. And you have to have the discipline of waking up early, even more than when you had a manager. It's not that, oh, now that I'm a manager, I'll take three years of vacation, or I'll go travel for five weeks. No, it doesn't happen that way with, with great business people. That's why they're business people. That's why they have their businesses, because they work. So how can I put my hands on someone so that their business can grow as if they were magic beans? No, it won't work. Paul knew that promoting someone before their heart was ready could produce disaster. And that's where many of us fail. We feel a call to do something for God, for our businesses, for, for anything. But we are not sure that our heart, that our character is at the height of what we're asking for. They say that in order to produce a cabbage, it takes three months. But to produce an oak tree, it takes 50 years. If I were a modern preacher, I would tell you, tell the person next to you, are you a cabbage or are you an oak tree? But let me save you from that. <laughs> because the person next to you doesn't want to hear your voice. Are you a cabbage or are you, or are you an oak tree? Three months or, or 50 years. So going back to the story of Moses, when Pharaoh finds out 
about the death of the Egyptian that Moses had killed. He tries to kill Moses. So Moses flees to the, to the region of Midian and he stays there as a stranger. Moses believed that God would use him for a great liberation, but now he is running to save his own life. He can't even free his own life. Why does God sometimes give us dreams, and I insist, visions that end up in failure and frustration? I can give you a list. I told you about that first one. It's not that after the age of 22, never again did it happen to me. No, it continued happen happening to me. And ministries and different things and projects that cost a lot more than they should have because it wasn't the right time. Because I wanted to do, I had the calling, but I wasn't waiting for the time. God had given Moses the desire to free his people, to rescue his people, and he began to live the nightmare of those that are cast into a void due to faith before God sends them. The desire was genuine, but the time was not the opportune moment. How many times do we step on the gas in life before the light turns green? That always puts our life at risk. If the light is yellow or red and you step on the gas, it's always a risk. In the worst of cases, it's a tragedy. Last Sunday, I spoke of lazy people that don't do anything with the excuse of, I don't want to get ahead of God, remember? Remember that? Oh, I don't want to get ahead of God. I want to wait on God. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's the person that doesn't want to get ahead of God. And they, uh, they ask one foot for permission to move the other. And they're a lazy person that doesn't want to get ahead of God. They don't do anything. On the other end, on the antipodes of the spectrum, there are those that live jumping to action before God sends them all the time. It's the syndrome of the offered instead of the called. <laughs> They're always offering themselves for everything. And you say, well, you know, that's a good thing. Yeah, but it carries its risk. They're easy to recognize because they're jumping from vision to vision, from revelation to revelation. They never remain in one thing. They're never focused. They never solidify themselves in one thing. There's nothing worse than having a guide or a parent or a pastor or a president. They may not even get there that has mood swings every week. One day they tell you one thing. The other day it's another. Then they change their vision. Then God revealed something else to them. One day we were an evangelical church. Now we're a missionary church. Now I don't know why I'm saying this. God changed my message. God changed my revelation. And you say, that's enough. I have enough to deal with with my mother-in-law. I don't need another crazy person in my life. I got to know many people when I was, when I was younger, when I was an adolescent. In my congregation, they would abandon their jobs. Some would even abandon their families to live by faith. The Lord is calling me to live by faith. No, it wasn't living by faith. It was, let me wait for someone to, to, to sustain me. People that's, that would leave their, their jobs at, their, at the factory, they left their in, in medical insurance, and they would live off of faith. Their kids were starving of hunger. My, my kid's stomach was touching his back, and someone knocked on the door and came in with the sandwich, and, and that's my testimony of faith. Really? No, that's just a lack of faith. I'm a man of faith. But faith has to do with the moment in which God says, step off the boat and walk towards me. So why does God call, call us to certain tasks like Moses just to then allow us fall on our faces? I was going to say on, on your butt, on your rear end, but let me just say on your face. I know why. I know why God lets Moses fall on his face. <laughs> Because there was too much Moses in Moses. Why did God let me fall on my face? Because there was too much Dante in Dante. And you can also put your name in the example. Because it would be a great example. The motivations and Moses' intentions, they were noble, I insist. But his character wasn't ready for the demands of the mission. And God doesn't just bless good intentions. You can't say, well, I had good intentions. No, God doesn't bless just intentions. I wanted to sow for God. God knows that if I had money, I would give it. No, God won't bless an intention or what you could have done. No, God doesn't bless hypotheticals. 
No, no, no. God knows that I would go and serve in Africa. If I had the time, I would be the first one to go. That doesn't count for God. You didn't go. It's a hypothetical. It's not something that I would do. That's the great failure of many evangelicals that write on social media. They say, why don't you go here? That's what I would do. Well, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you helping your neighbor next door? Why don't you give the Asian neighbor next door by giving them some rice, help them when they're hungry? But no, you want to help people on other continents. God doesn't bless good intentions. So when Moses kills the Egyptian, it was clear that he was acting under his own judgment, not under God's plan. And there were aspects of his character that God had to polish in such a way that God signs him up into the university of character at the desert branch with the post-grad of, tran of personal transformation. God is always interested in our character more than our success, more than our circumstances. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want this, world to be, this year to be good for us. God wants us to triumph. But more than that, He wants to forge our character so that we can manage what He wants to give us. Are we in agreement, yes or no? He has to forge us so that we can sustain that, right? There are people that if God allowed them to be famous then God would lose them. There are people that if God allowed them to have more money, he would lose them. There are people that aren't ready because they lose control immediately. And you might say, well, who doesn't lose control? Well, those of us that have fallen on our face a lot. Those of us that have stumbled many times. So from the promise to the fulfillment, there is always a transition. And this is a word that we're going to mention a lot this year. Transition from the promise to the fulfillment process. The majority of us don't fail in believing God, but we fail in waiting for the process and we want everything to be now. Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. No, it won't happen. Because God has to place us in a process. You know why there are so many divisions amongst us? the evangelical people because we spend our time disputing who has the real franchise and us evangelicals place everything under a single phrase look i'm not i'm not i'm not criticizing others i'm criticizing ourselves we have the famous phrase god told me and period not even we're sure that god said it but you know just in case god said to me or god showed me that's another level Oh, last night, uh, God showed me that I have to, uh, I have to go, um, my love, I have to go kill your mother. God showed me. God sent me. Oh, God sent me. Well, why are you doing that? Well, because I obey God. We always say that we're under authority as long as we agree with that authority. As soon as we're displeased with something, and don't look at me with that face as if to say, oh, no, I come from Switzerland. I don't know. No, this is something that all Hispanics have. Someone said amen. Glory to God that a sinner came here today. As soon as we don't like something, then we open up our small church, our small denomination, and our own doctrine. You know how many denominations there are officially? There's 33,000 denominations. They all believe they're going to be the only ones in heaven. 33,000. Without counting the hundreds that open up their churches with no denomination. We sometimes criticize. We shouldn't. But we criticize the Catholic Church for many reasons. But the Catholic Church has a hierarchy. It starts with the deacon. Look at, look at the career you have to have. <laughs> Some say, oh, I, I dream of being the Pope. No, it's it's not that. It's not like that. You're going to be a potato, not the Pope. <laughs> so you first, you're a deacon, then priest, then bishop, archbishop, metropolitan, primates, cardinal, major archbishop, patriarch, the primate, <laughs> the Presbyterian cardinal, the bishop cardinal, and finally, our beloved Argentinian, the Pope. Now, look at that whole career. I'm not judging any any doctrines before anyone stows me. I started the year well, <laughs> right? <laughs> what a way to kickstart. But we can never, ever, ever talk about the errors of the Catholics 
will never ever see an altar boy that disagrees with the with the with the parish priest so he goes and opens an own chapel around the corner no right scripturally speaking we can all speak to God but we go to the other extreme and so since God speaks to us directly that gives us a license to say God sent me God said to me and period it's not up for debate it's not up for discussion as long as you say God spoke to me God told me not to pay you period yeah but you have a debt with me yeah you know what I feel like paying you but God said no don't pay him so that he can learn look at that and all of a sudden, under that umbrella of God said to me, you don't go through any test for your character. We're incongruent with biblical, biblical foundations. I'm not a guy that'll say, if you leave my, my coverage. No, I don't believe in that. And all these years of this Christian walk, this Christian pilgrimage, I've gotten to know many people with genuine callings that have failed rotundly or robustly because they went without being sent. They didn't wait. And what I'm, what I'm about to say to you is as real as a law of gravity. God's principles work, and it's impossible to violate them. God's principles work. If I throw this Bible here, and it'll fall here to the ground, it'll fall in Australia and in China. The law of gravity works anywhere around the world. And in all these years, I've seen people leaving a company or leave their family, leave their country, leave a ministry with good reason, with good intentions, but the way in which they left by creating discord or creating division, they end up not harvesting in their own lives because it's a natural law. There are people that change churches, change jobs because they're tired of living under authority. But wherever we go, we're going to be under authority, always. We're always going to have authority over us. We're under a denomination, the Assemblies of God. I'm under authority. I can't do whatever I want. We're all always going to be under authority, no matter where we go. And when we leave any place, and this is, I, I felt like teaching you this. I'm not teaching it from the perspective of, oh, I've never been through it. No, I've suffered through this. I'm like the, the parent that doesn't want their child to go through the same thing. When you leave a place without honoring, we're going to harvest dishonor no matter where we go. When you don't honor your children, then as, as, as you're older, you're going to harvest dishonor. When you don't honor your parents, then you won't receive honor from your children. I've never seen someone try and divide a congregation start their own church and not harvest dozens of their own divisions. I've spoken with pastor friends that have said, I've already had 50 divisions at the church. And I ask, well, how did you leave your other church? And they say, no, well, the pastor did this, that, and the other, so I ran for my life. Well, then there it is. It's a natural law. It never fails. It's a natural law like sowing and harvesting. Jacob leaves his, his father-in-law's home, Laban. This is a fabulous biblical story. He escapes in the night out of fear that his father-in-law won't bless him. And in Genesis 31, 27, his father-in-law reaches him and he says, Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? He hadn't stolen anything, but he felt that he had stolen his honor. Why didn't you tell me that you wanted to run away, son-in-law? I would have sent you on your way with joy and tambourines and harps. You didn't allow me to say goodbye to my daughters or my grandchildren. You acted like a, like a fool, like an imbecile. And Jacob received this reprimand. So when we leave without being sent, we leave with very sharp edges of our character that will eventually be polished here or there. I like it when God polishes my character in intimacy, in the closet while I'm praying. He says, change this, change that. And man, does it hurt. But it hurts more when it's done publicly. I want it to be done in secret. God waited many years, or David waited many years to be king, even though he knew he was, he was going to be called to be king. And King Saul was already too old or too weak to be a monarch. 
And while he awaited the process of the transition, he learned a series of lessons that molded his character. And that's something that us Hispanics need to learn. And you don't have someone preaching to you that says, oh, in heaven, they, they don't speak Spanish. No, I'm Hispanic too. I'm more Hispanic because I was born way down south. The further south you go, the more Hispanic you are. The closer to Antarctica you're, you are, the more Hispanic you are. That's, it's one of our weaknesses. It's, it's a cultural syndrome. We have the tendency that when we don't like something, we disappear and we don't leave any trace. We're like Batman. We go, vroom, vroom, vroom. And we have to learn that when we're going to abandon a job or a position at a certain company, go to the authority. It doesn't matter if they were, if they were fools or scammers. I'm talking about what we want to harvest and tell your authority, I'm considering making a change. It doesn't matter that in this country they fire you on a Friday at 5 p.m. and they say, sorry, I'm so sorry, security please, and they carry you out. That's who they are. I'm not going to change my character because of the world that surrounds me. Everyone gives from what they have. I'm in a neighborhood where nobody greets you. Nobody. It doesn't matter. Every time I go out to the mailbox or take out the trash, I say, good morning, good morning, morning. And I say, one day they'll say it back. And they look at me. Because when Americans go out and walk with their dogs, they don't like to be greeted. But where I come from, my mom would say, you need to greet them. Because I want to walk through the neighborhood with my head held up high. And I don't want people to say that you're uneducated. And so now I say hi to even shadows because I, I don't want to be uneducated. And I have a neighbor that goes out with her dogs and she never greets anyone. And if she can, she'll throw her dogs to you. I'll say, good morning, good morning. Hi. Hey. And she's never answered me, not even until now. But she will one day, even if it's in heaven. Maybe she'll get to heaven and say, oh, he's who used to say hi to me. Or maybe if she goes to heaven, I don't know. But I won't change for others. Where I come from, I don't change due to my surroundings. I won't say, oh, if people around me are uneducated, I'll become an educator. No. So go up to your, your boss, and even if they're a scammer, say, you know what, I'm considering leaving at the end of the month. Look for a replacement if you have to. Or go to our pastor or leader and say, of honoring you for so many years, if I was here for so long, it's because I thought you were a good pastor, but maybe I changed my opinion now. But so many years of service and loyalty, I want you to help me and pray to see if it's time to go to a different place. Ushers have left here, giving their name tag as if to say, here, take my badge and my gun. And they leave. And I say, what do you mean they left? Yeah, they left. And they don't tell you where. Then you see them on social media that they're at another church doing something else. And who's going to stop them? Hey, I feel like going somewhere else, a smaller church or a different place, and wait for the blessing. It's not the same as saying, hey, I'm leaving. I tend to ask people, are you asking for my blessing and, or, and advice, or are you communicating it to me? Isn't that what us parents do sometimes? Hey, are you asking for permission, or are you letting me know? Because it's not the same thing to say, hey, I'm leaving, and they leave. No, it's asking for a blessing and say, I'm considering leaving. Who's going to stop you? Well, you're going to leave all the same, right? Maybe we have the right calling, but we have to understand how to make the changes. So record the spiritual principle. Don't burn bridges anywhere. You never know when you'll need it in the future. One day you'll want to cross that bridge. You're going to need that reference. Don't burn bridges in what respects you. The Lord says, be in peace with all men. Let me tell you a little a little. A few secrets. We still have some time. In these 15 years that we've been a church, many people have left River to develop their own ministries, and that's healthy. In the majority of cases, it's very healthy. I'm no one to doubt anyone's personal calling. I can't say God only speaks to me, but he can't speak to you. No, I would be going against what I preach. But what determines them doing well or not whether they fail or not, there's one thing that, that determines it. Anytime someone leaves, and I even write it on a piece of paper, and I have eyewitnesses that I do it, 
I always take a little napkin because I'm very conservative in, in a few things and I always do the same thing. I take a napkin or a paper and I write it down so that they can keep it with them. Maybe later they'll use it as toilet paper. I have no clue, but I give it to them. I look at the person in their eyes and I say, I know your vision is noble and I rejoice. And in the beginning you're going to see that starting a business or a ministry is simple because everything always looks easy from the outside. It's like going to eat at a good restaurant and saying, my dream is to have my own. Who hasn't said that before? Oh, how beautiful. Have my own picture frames and paintings. I already have the logo and the idea and the menu. I will take each one of those dreamers and take them all to the kitchen for a few minutes so that they can see what that hell and chaos is during peak hours where everyone comes for dinner. When they say, this is what I asked for. This is an almond milk. Go and milk the almond itself. When that happens to you and you're in the kitchen, you feel like going out and killing everyone like Rambo. And you say, I'll get locked up, but at least I'll do what I want. You dream because you see the elegant part, the, the tables, the food. And I say, this is it's the same thing. You have every intention to do things right. And you'll say this, well, I'll do the same thing that I saw. If you want to be a pastor, then I'll dress more or less like you. I'll say some similar phrases. The multitudes will follow me. I'll have resources. I'll, I'll travel through the world. We all want that. But as the days go by, you begin to realize that the Lord signed you up for the University of Character and everything's uphill. When the resources don't arrive, when you close your eyes and you see no one came, I've lived those moments where you don't want to open your eyes and you say, Lord, we want to worship you. But you don't. You actually just don't want to open your eyes because you don't want to see how few people there are. When your business isn't what you dreamed, the enemy, and I say this to the person that leaves, or whoever leaves, I say the enemy is going to try and take you down the shortcut of dishonor. And you're going to try and recruit people that you left behind, that you couldn't take with you. At this point, they always interrupt me and they say, no, 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 pastor, I'll never do that. But I answer and I say, yes, you will do it. It's a pattern. When your character can no longer sustain or hold up the process, you're going to try and take a harvest that isn't yours. If you worked as a slave in someone else's field, when you decide to leave that assignment, you can't harvest the grain uh, from the seed that you planted. That belongs to the owner of the field. That belongs to the position that you held, not you as an individual. So by the love of God, as much as you want, for your own good, don't take the, the road of dishonor. And when I warn them, they always look at me as if I'm trying to say to them, oh, don't steal one of my sheep. And I always clarify, look, they're not my sheep. I didn't die on the cross for anyone. I always say the same thing. And on top of it all, no sheep allows to be stolen. Who wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I woke up in Saddleback. But didn't you go to river? Yeah, but they stole me. That's not Dante. That's Maldonado. I was stolen. No, that, that doesn't happen. If you want to be stolen, then yeah, I guess you'll be stolen. However, it's a spiritual principle. God always honors authority. And let me tell you what happens next. And this happens in almost every church around the world. And colleagues will confirm it. Colleagues that are being healed with this message right now. Some, maybe the least of them, don't burn bridges, nor do they dishonor authority that they were under for a long time. These are the people that prosper and grow. If they have nothing good to say, they don't say anything. You don't have to be saying good things hypocritically. You have nothing good to say, don't say anything. These are the people that, when they have to go to back to a a business or, or, a, or a, a company or a ministry, they left good character, good testimony. But then there are others that try and speak with others to divide and recruit. They always manage to gather a group, never more than 20 people that believe in that messianic vision. But there are people that can either follow us because they love what we love or because they hate what we hate. In the best of cases, they'll remain because love and hate can keep people together. But the other option is hate. 
can also gather votes. But it's a corrosive combustible that can't gather anyone for a long time. There are presidential candidates that reach the presidency by gathering votes due to hate to the, to the last government, the last administration. But if this new administration doesn't have a purpose for the future, hate won't take them very far. Hate doesn't gather people for a long time. And in spirituality, it's the same. We can gather here due to love of God or hate for the devil or fear of the devil. How many churches are there like that? If you stop tithing and sowing, then Satan will come to your home. And people say, no, 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 let me give some money. Well, how long can that last? So you can recruit people out of love for the flaming new pastor that has a possibility to grow or out of hate for the old pastor and old congregation they left behind. And that bad motivation is you leaping into catastrophe. Let's never get out of the boat unless we know the Lord is calling us. Especially because we're not going to walk upon calm Caribbean waters. No, it's a frizzy sea. Having children is, is a frizzy sea. Getting married is a frizzy sea. Starting a ministry is a frizzy sea. So if we decide to get off the boat, it's best that the Lord is there with us. Are you with me? And now you say, well, what can I do now that I'm in the desert? I already messed up. Or I'm in the middle of the sea drowning. One thing you don't want to do is try to cut the experience in the, in the desert short. One of the main reasons as to why God places us there is to deal with us. So we'll never grow in our faith if we continue lacking in our character. So instead of praying so that the Lord shortens the duration of our difficult times, we have to say, Lord, help me to learn quickly from this experience. That's how Asians pray. I was told that Koreans never pray by saying, Lord, take away the problem. They say, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this problem so that this problem can go away? Forty years later, we find a Moses that's so different. He was about to graduate from the desert campus of the University of Character. He was confident. He was almost Argentinian. He wanted to set his people free, but then he had become humble. His first son was named Gershom, and that means I am a stranger in a different land. Us immigrants know that we're not from here or from there, definitively. That lack of belonging is what Moses felt. He named his other son Eliezer. The God of my father helped me, and he freed me from Pharaoh's sword. You know, he never said, he was so discouraged that he didn't say my God. He said, the God of my father. He felt that God was so far that he didn't even say my God. So later on, once Moses finally becomes the freer of his people, Numbers 12.3 says, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. More humble than anyone else. The desert had changed them like that. In his corrective classes of the University of Character, he was transformed, tested, and then sent out. God had been with Moses the whole time, remodeling him for the future. And what he believed was abandonment was preparation and process. We can't confuse preparation with God abandoning you. No, God was forming you. He is forming you for a great vision. And now Moses was a silhouette of that man that had taken God's matters into his own hands. And he tried to explain to God why he wasn't ready. Moses said, you know what? I would love it. I love this. Moses said, God, I'm not ready. Who am I to do this? Who, who, who am I going to say sent me? And then he says, but what if they don't believe me? But remember that I don't have an ease with words. I, I stutter. And he says, please send someone else. How interesting. When Moses considered himself adequate to free his people, God said, useless. Decades later, when he considered himself useless, God says, now you're ready for the mission. He graduated. He transformed himself into a humble man, ready to serve in complete dependence of the Lord. That's what I want all of us to live in this year of transition. Maybe... Like me, when I was 22, you did something, you thought you were sent, and you did something to embarrass yourself. And you thought that God would back you 
with that personal pro project or whatever it was. If that's true, don't try and evade God's process. He's going to process you. He's going to prepare you. He's going to use that mistake to mold you. He's going to use that error to make of you a humble person. And I believe I received this message on behalf of the Lord with my gaze on a, de on a determined public. I think he gave me this message for the broken, the one that's tired of the desert, the one that's exhausted, for those that are carrying the shameful burden of a bad decision and they change that luggage from hand to hand to deal with the weight. They can't do it anymore. This message is for those that have weak knees, for the weak, for those that, have, that feel that they, haven't that they didn't accomplish anything in the last year, for the sinful men and women with, with defects, in, with limited talents, this message goes to the clay vessels that advance, but they're made of clay. For the bent over, for the injured, for those that feel that their life continuously disappoints God. But it's also for the sincere disciples that admit that they're fools, that they're imbeciles. This is a message for all those that have felt discouraged and tired. But fundamentally, for those of us that shouldn't forget that with the promise that God gave you, the process is coming. Are we in agreement? Let's remember that from the process, or from, from the promise to the fulfillment, there will be a transition. And like Moses, when you say, I'm ready, Lord, God says, mm, no, you're still inadequate. I'm not going to run the risk of losing you by sending you this way. And when you say, yeah, I'm good for nothing. I've tried it all. I don't think God can do anything with me. That's where God sees us and says, you're ready for my mission. That's what I wanted. Complete dependence. May 2024 be the transition, my beloved, of the promise that you have to the victory. And above all things, may this be the best year of our lives because we're going to graduate from the University of Character and we're going to close one season, one period, to begin another one. Does someone believe it? Say amen. Hallelujah. Give a grand applause to the Lord. In this first message of the year, blessed be God. Come on, celebrate the King of Glory and say, Lord, you've spoken to me once again. How the Lord loves you. How can he not love you if he didn't love you? He wouldn't speak to you this way. How the Lord loves you. Hallelujah. Someone needs to celebrate more than that. The king has spoken to your life today. Impressive. How many say, I receive it in my heart. And I want to pray for all those people on the other side that have accompanied us the whole year. Well, the year that just left us. And God willing will continue to accompany us as long as they have to, especially for those that are weary due to bad decisions. It's true that this congregation, we have many new people and others that came from other congregations. Maybe it's the moment to say, maybe you have to make a phone call. If they decide to not give you a blessing, then that's not your problem. But you should say, I want to finish every season well. And if somebody's going to close a season, close it in blessing. Know to get off the wave with elegance in the right moment. That's the great secret of maturity, of character. Facing. If someone has debts and they can't face them yet, there's a way of honoring your debts. The old-fashioned way, my dad would say, show your face. It's marvelous. It's better than not answering the phone or not speaking to them by saying you're busy or saying you're not there. No, just give your face and say, I'm going to pay you. I don't know how, but I'm going to pay you. Man, have I got had to go through that. It hurts. It's shameful. It's embarrassing. They've said, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to bring a lawsuit. And this was during a time where I was traveling around the world to pay off those debts. But I would say, I'm going to pay you. I don't know how or when, but look at me in the eyes. I'm a man of faith. I won't hide because someone is going to embarrass me and say, this person left me with debts. No, I'm just saying, this is what I've learned through pain. 
So as Hispanics and everyone that's watching from different parts of the world, we have to learn to always take the, the, the route of honor, the road of honor. Sometimes it's shameful, sometimes it's painful, but always, 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 it brings a harvest of honor, always. The road of honor is leaving the right way. Even when we don't agree with things, even if when we don't like certain things, leaving the right way, finishing things right. I know there are many people that have gotten divorced and they have terrible relationships because sometimes the ex doesn't necessarily believe things the way or understand things the way you understand them. But even then you have to say, Lord, in my respects, I'm going to give honor. It doesn't matter if on the other side there's insult and, and abuse. No, you're going to give what you have. Like the story of that neighbor that would throw trash to her uh, over the wall to her neighbor, but the other neighbor would throw back flowers. And the, and the other neighbor, the, the, the woman said, why are you throwing flowers to me? And, and the man said, well, because I throw what I have. I have flowers. You say, my character won't change because of those that have bad character or bad politicians or scammers or bad, bad preachers or pastors. My life doesn't depend on the pastor's spiritual life or the integrity of those that sit in the Oval Office or those that lead our countries in Latin America. We are what we are, and we're going where we're going. And here in the U.S., it's not that we don't litter because Americans look at us bad. No, wherever we go, even if there's a dump, we'll look for a trash can, a trash bin, because it's part of all cul part of our culture moving forward, part of our character, part of who we are. Where I come from, you have to say, I learned to bless. Where I come from, we don't tolerate gossip. Not only do I not speak it, I don't listen to it. I don't want gossip to be deposited in me. Where I come from, we serve the Lord. And if one day God takes you out of river, no matter what you do, say, in that time, I learned to bless others. I want to be known by how I love others, by how I bless, by how I sow. And then they'll know that you have a God that everyone will want to know. That's character. May they speak about your life and your attitude. May your attitude speak louder than your words. What if we say, Lord, mold us. But careful because he will mold you. You will be molded, but don't be scared. Oh, no, I don't know if I should ask for it. No, say, Lord, I want to finish 2024, December of 2024. I want to be a better person than what I am now. Do you want to trust in the Lord? Look, there's just a few that, that even dare. Do you dare to trust in the Lord's dealings with you, yes or no? There we go. In my country, they say, you're scared. Do they use this in Mexico as well? They say, hey, your heart is fluttering like this. Lord, I'm going to trust in you. I'm not saying, send me tests. No, but Lord, I trust that you're going to be the best teacher this year. I want to have a better character, and I know that you're the only one that can mold me. Lift up your hands. We're going to pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the morning, afternoon, or night, no matter where they're watching. Lord, I've spoken what I believe you told me to tell these people. And now that this word has been let out, seal it with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're willing to have you deal with us. Take the sharp edges from our character. I know that there are still things that need to die, and we can't kill them. We can't apply euthanasia spiritually, but... You can eliminate, remove, exterminate what is a surplus, what doesn't please your name, what doesn't exalt your glory. Take away the dark parts of our lives. Lord, we begin a process to become better, and we're not going to confuse process with abandonment. Because you love us, because you speak to us, because you have us sculpted in your hands, and there isn't anyone that can take us from your hands. Thank you, Lord. I pray for those that are receiving the Lord now for the first time. Those that say, come into my life, change my heart, transform my mind. Lord, I've spoken what I believe you told me to tell these people without my own private opinions or personal opinions, without any hidden agendas. I've said without adding or removing what I believe 
is your revelation. This first letter for the church of Christ in the world. This messenger has given the letter and is free of each word and each transition and each conviction or what each person will do. Father, I'm free of this word from here on out. This living word that has led out logos that becomes a, a challenge. And from here on out, it will be flesh. It will be a part of the dynamic of each person's life. I let out your blessing. I believe it. I declare it. And in this January of 2024, let us be blessed in the body, in the soul, and in the spirit. Amen. Amen. And amen. Glory to Jesus. What a prayer. Say it with me. I receive it. Give an applause to the Lord. Loud. May God bless you. Bye, bye, bye. Happy New Year. Until next Sunday. Blessing. Apareciste una noche de soledad Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciéndome no temas Yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti me curaste las heridas, me sanaste mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz Algo tan grande no lo puedo comprender Oigo tu dulce voz diciéndome una y otra vez Oh, 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 oh. eres bienvenido, eres sanado una y otra vez Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciéndome no temas, yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas, me sanaste mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz